Hey everybody and welcome to the 17th Can You Believe It episode in the Song of Ice and Fire epic linear reread from Vassals of Kingsgrave, an offshoot of an offshoot of a podcast of Ice and Fire, the longest running podcast dedicated to the works of George R. R. Martin, as are we in some ways, I guess. So my name's been a 007 on the forums of APOIAF and we have a lot of fellow podcasters on the episode today, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, starting with Adam. Hey, this is Adam, Drown Snow on the forum. Hey, this is Amanda, Middle Cyclone on the forums. Hi, this is Claire, Dark Sister 24 on the forums. This is Matt, Varley on the forums. Hey, this is Michael, I go as Carl Wadegi on the forums. Hi everyone, this is Nadia. And greetings, mortals. It is Patrick, Patrick the Tall on the forums. And hopefully um, at some point later today, today we'll be joined by Jackie, who's um, Joa Olivier on the forums. Um, he's having, you know, there's always some poor soul who has weird Skype issues and sadly it's her, but hopefully she'll be with us in time for her chapter. So today we are, you know, knee deep in Clash of Kings, which is exciting because when I last was on this podcast, we we're still Game of Thrones. We are going to cover the events of 18th of February, 299 to the 28th of February. And that is Cat 1, Aria 3, Tyrion 2, and Aria 4. So only four chapters this week, but all the feels. So it just felt like Aria 4 in particular needed some space to breathe, so to say. Um, we finished the last episode, which hashtag Greg hopefully is editing at some point. <laughs> Subtle hint. On Sansa 1, which happened on the 10th of February 299, which is Joffrey's name day. So between that chapter and Cat 1, um, White Raven arrives at Winterfell to announce the autumn, so autumn has come, and Cat 1 happens on the 18th of February, so we've skipped forward four chapters um, to get to that week later. So over to Amanda with the recap. Catelyn 1. The chapter opens with Catelyn describing Rob's new crown, which has been modelled on the old Kings of Winter's uncomfortable bronze and iron hat fashion. It apparently doesn't fit well or is uncomfortable due to Rob's constant adjusting. Rob meets with Sir Cleos Frey, who is such a beta male. He orders Cleos to bring Cersei his terms, including releasing Sansa and Arya, returning Eddard's bones with ice, start, um, trading the Stark Bannermen captives for Lannister captives, Sans Jamie, recognizing the sovereignty of the North and the Riverlands Kingdom, and getting some highborn Lannister hostages that can be released once a year later. Car Stark is disgusted and leaves to plot and kill the kids. Catelyn feels horribly guilty for pushing Eddard to accept the handship, which is not her fault, because he's an adult man who is bad at politics. I feel about Eddard the way Silence feels about John sometimes. Catelyn observes that Edmure is a nice boy and a shitty ruler who let the River Lords, Bracken, etc., go home to get murdered and hostaged. Rob and Catelyn argue about the war, and Rob points out he can't back out because he'll be unkinged, and Catelyn points out more bloodshed will not bring your father back. Kellen also points out more generous terms might have ended the war sooner and that Cersei will only trade Jaime for Arya and Sansa. This argument's sad because embodies how little women are valued in the society, though I understand for political reasons, though it's still heartbreaking when Catelyn says girls are not important enough. Catelyn refuses to go to the twins, which would have been a potentially good roadblock for Walder, though I'm going to head that off at the jump because she could just be a hostage like they planned post-Red Wedding or to go with Theon to be dropped off on his way north. She encourages that Theon remain a hostage and that someone else be sent to Balon, but Rob refuses. She leaves Rob and goes through the godswood to see Hoster and Brynden, who has arrived, and they discuss Hoster's decline and the comet, which Brynden describes as an omen of blood and death in the war. End of chapter. <laughs> so Kat actually had some good advice this chapter. She the totally Theon did. Business. Well, yeah. I mean, it would have been a... It was kind of like a Hail Mary, but... Uh, in a sense, maybe not a Hail Mary, but a, a long shot that he would get uh, uh, Balon with him. But uh, then again, what would be the, the best chance he could have gotten off getting Balon on his side? That would, that would have been Theon, right? But if he doesn't yeah. send Theon, Theon can't go sack Winterfell. I no, mean, he but, doesn't know that. No one can no, know that. No one can know that. In the end, it's Theon's stupidity that essentially leads to that decision. Not even not even Balin told him to do that. He didn't even want him to do that. But uh, the whole thing with uh, Theon is the fact that Theon was always meant to be the insurance to, for Balon's good behavior. Yeah, but usually you send you send your wards, ba your hostages back, uh, like after a while, and. Uh, and Theon is a man grown. He's not supposed to be a hostage so much anymore, really. But, but well, what is the technicality on that? So when he takes someone as a ward slash hostage, 
do, is there some age of maturity that they get back or do, do you not just keep them until we've heard about st- situations where you you take hostages like you took you took hostages from Dorn and that was essentially as an insurance until there seemed to be peace in in whatever region it was so one could just think especially because of Ned Stark he would <laughs> he would not necessarily have he have kept kept uh, Theon for his whole life not against his will at least so yeah would you just think that it well maybe i just think that uh, that Theon would have been released even uh, soon enough at least because he's he was man grown i just don't feel we have any precedent for that in the novel which doesn't mean it wouldn't happen but yeah well there there there's just other times where people take war take wars or hostages and they kind of do it on the premise that as long as you guys are nice, you will get to be uh, released at some point in, out in the future. John the Fiddler is a good example. I don't remember his real name as like a Blackfire, but Blood Raven takes him as a hostage post the um, failed like mm. uprising. I don't think Blood Raven ever releases him. No, he kills him. Yeah, he's doesn't killed he? in captivity. No, he gets killed at the masked ball by um, some obvious Blackfire conspirators. So, but that, that's not a good, necessarily a good example, though, because if you get killed by a third party, or you get killed because you're the people you're trying to uh, extort are actually not keeping to the deals, then then we wouldn't actually know if they would be released at some point. Right, and I think a good comparison is um, just Theon as a ward, you know, air quotes, and like Ned and Robert as wards at uh, the Eyrie. Like, mm. there's one where it's like more implied as a hostage, like, okay, we're yeah. going to, you know, raise your kid and educate him and like, you know, teach him how to fight and everything, but we'll, we'll take off his head if he rise up again. Whereas it's just more of an alliance based and like, you know, even for his wards, he goes to war. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a gray area, but it was just maybe it's just me that assumed that that especially Ned would would be a bit more lenient on that account, especially because I mean, yes, it was like nine, ten, ten, what, eleven years ago that uh, Grey or Rebellion uh, happened. So it's That's... like a long. It's it maybe feels like a long time since. I, mean, I don't know. There's also, um, Eddard made that order to um, Kat when she was going to go north, but then didn't. That was like, hey, make sure you keep Theon in hand because you might need his dad. Yeah, and what if Theon actually succeeded? Like, if the Ironborn like were like, oh yeah, we'll fight along with you to the north if, as long as we get our islands, that's fine. Like, let's do this. Like, what would have happened? Like, they would have sacked Lannisport again. And probably would have brought like the Lannisters to back home to defend like their own land rather than going after Stannis, right? Yeah, yeah. It right. would essentially, it would essentially have uh, have turned the war uh, very much in in Rob's favor. So, so yeah. It's, if it would have worked, it would have been a really good move, but it didn't. So, yeah. Shucks. <laughs> And did anyone like the little character touches that come all the way through Clash of Kings when people are interpreting the comments? So, of course, Edmure thinks, oh, it's red for Tully colours. Idiot. Goddamn, everyone is bloody interpreting this comment. Like, it's just a fucking (laughs) comment. But I think it's brilliant because it it tells you a lot about that character. So Edmure is all sort of, you know, full of himself in the house. Whereas the Blackfish is old and cynical and says, no, it just bespeaks blood spilled on every side in the war. So... I just like the way George uses it, just in this very short way to give you little character flourishes. Yeah. Well, so far in every chapter, it's like, oh no, it's red for you know, um, you know, blood and fire. It's red for Joffrey, and, uh, you know, becoming king. It's red for Lannister. You know, everyone's like, oh, it's red for good something. And old Nan smells it and's like, no, nah, it means dragons. He's yeah. right. He's gonna be right. But is she right? Old I mean, Nan. Basically, everyone's just well, interpreting maybe. it. With whatever is relevant to them. Exactly. The but that's dragon have some bag, but is that really why the comet is there? We but, don't know. It's just comet. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. Isn't that essentially what we all do in every situation where there's something that's up to be interpretation? Like maybe even George's books? 
Patrick Holly, are you saying that we're self-involved and narcissistic? <gasps> How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> I was thinking just that we are very subjective in our opinions about uh, characters and happening, like what ha- happens in the books, so much so that it might be even up to interpretation of what sometimes happens. Oh, totally. That's why you can have all the theorizing and stuff, right? So no, no, right. no. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but everything I put out is very objective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Maybe yeah, this you, is you... is this a good time to break conversation and just bring in Jackie, who managed to join us? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Great. Hey. Welcome, Jackie. Hello. Hey. <laughs> can you at... hear me? We can. Crystal yeah. clear audio. Okay. Anyway, proceed, everyone. I don't know what else we really want to talk about with Cat One. Um, how Robin Gag's relationship is changing. Oh, yeah. Good point. Heartbreaking. He just dismisses yeah. her casually. Ugh. Well, yeah, yeah he's a but teenager and his mom's trying Catelyn, to butt in. I've, I've always defended Catelyn's decision to release Jamie because at that point she has lost two of her sons and, you know, she's trying to get her daughters back and she's very, very desperate. But at this point, that still hasn't happened, right? It's it's just basically Ned right. has died, but that's it. Um, yeah. The Winterfell is still secure. Bran and Rickon are secure so far, and the girls, as far as she knows, they're 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 hostages, but they're noble hostages, right? So, um, as far as she knows, right? Yeah. Even at this point, she's telling Rob that he should be exchanging Jamie for Sansa and Arya, which it would be a really bad decision, which would be like a shortcut to losing the war. Well, but is yeah. there a point to the war? Yeah, the, th- the thing is for me, I see, think that Jamie is, yeah, he's a great symbol of, of Lannister uh, you know, confidence and, and superiority in, in a sense, but he is not especially a good uh, commander as we've talked about before. So releasing him might not just win, might not really win the war really. Uh, and I think I think the situation is as it is right now that that you know that the Starks won't kill uh, Jamie Lannister, but you don't know that the Lannister won't kill the the Stark kids. Yeah, <laughs> and like that, them having Jamie hasn't really prevented anything. Like the war has gone on exactly like it would have. Right. Yeah. Like it, in theory, it should have stopped when Tyrion got back right before the Battle of the Green Fork, right? Yeah. Like, okay, Tyrion's back. Uh, okay, we'll go back home now. Yeah. All right. Let's just talk this out, and you know, th- you know, people be angry, but hey, no, like this is what they wanted. Yeah. Well, well, stuff happened in between. First of all, they mustered the, their army, so it's pretty hard to just mar- march back without doing anything, especially. Second of all, uh, Ned got captured and attacked by Jamie Lannister. Uh, so that's not a thing you just let go especially not when you're already a bit well i mean wouldn't that be part of it is you, you sit down and you talk and you find a way to get in and back and you you know kind of work we'll go back to the north have a good day don't come don't come near us mm, maybe but i just that See, wouldn't make a good is, book the problem is even if no you, even if you do let jamie lannister go it's what would have He's happened after that rob's bannerman would not have been happy with him right they, no. they they're the ones who made him king and if he just lets Jamie Lannister go, it's uh, Rickard Castor would be out for his blood. Yeah, which yeah, he is yeah. eventually, right? <laughs> which he is already because uh, Rob is considering, you know, peace, peace. But it would be so much worse if you know he just lets Jamie go. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's been so many losses on the uh, on the Stark side, on the North side, by the hand of Jamie Lannister that uh, his his vassals would not uh, agree to to that deal in any deal because they just don't value Sansa's and Arya's life as much as they value their own sons and and uncles and heirs and dad, yeah, yeah. yeah whatever's <laughs> lives and that yeah they, they don't value they don't value the girls until maybe later in the books when they seem to value them quite a bit yeah the north remembers uh, yeah now eventually but that's well, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's all we got left. Girls left. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. It is terrible, but that's misogynistic for you, right yes. there. Yep. But yeah, it's like the person who's constantly told, like, no, 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 we don't want you, and then like, hey, you're you're the, you're the thing now. Yeah, I remember you. 
<laughs> now I remember you. <laughs> yeah, we're we're all we've been behind you guys since the beginning. Just so you know. Mm. Um, Claire, any thoughts on the chapter? Hard to get a word just... edgewise. I know with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just feel sorry for Rob. Like I just feel like any situation, any kind of thing that he decides to do, it's just not gonna it's not gonna work for him. So I just feel sorry for him, knowing what we know later on. I just read this chapter just like, oh my gosh, like, oh, what do they do? Like, I just felt sorry for everyone. He's yeah, the moment they crown Rob, he's screwed. Yeah. I, I was just about to say that, Amanda, like, that's, <laughs> that brings up the whole, like, uh, you know, King in the North, like, you know, argument. It's like, now he has to, like, lead, you know. Ugh. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say, too, that I was thinking today a lot about, um, like, democratic politics versus this kind of feudal stuff but thinking he's as constrained by his electorate like if he doesn't do you know he's under pressure from the car stocks and this faction and that faction and he has to keep everyone happy and he's just as constrained as any modern leader i i also feel huge sympathy for him um not obama the senate will block anything he throws up at him <sighs> jackie yeah. um any thoughts on this chapter <laughs> um no, really just echoing what you guys have already said. And I thought it was like, it kind of stuck out to me how clear George R. Martin like laid it out when Kat was like, oh, so the girls aren't important, are they? You know, and Rob was like, well, you know, <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Yeah. It's royal politics, it's like, but it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's like in regular diplomacy, yes. But this is like wartime and things are more complicated. <laughs> yeah. in like in... Uh peacetime diplomacy uh, sometimes like a, a female like a daughter or something could um, get more done like diplomacy diplomacy wise than a male heir could do uh, through marriage and stuff through marriage and stuff or just being very charming <laughs> I mean, yeah but i mean this this brings up the opposite question though like what if what if it had been cersei that had been captured like how much is tywin valuing her oh <laughs> even less oh, yeah. wow <laughs> As a like, oh, thank God, he got that her. bitch off my hands. Yeah, he'll, yeah, he'll, he... he'll value her insofar as, you know, no man left behind for the name of the family. He'll value yeah, exactly. her insofar as just to let her go to the dogs would be to cast dishonor in the family. So it, it'll be yeah. like a second order value. Just yeah, just like, kind of like a mine, you know, hey, don't touch. Yeah, you have to think about, like, like you think about Tyrion. I mean... Even Tyrion, whom he honestly has a lot of disdain for, it's like quite obviously that he has that. Just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, he even goes to war for that one. I mean, so that's pretty obvious that uh, <laughs> that it has, like, even if he even goes to war for Tyrion, then he would, of course, keep on going to war if they caught uh, Cersei. Well, Tyrion can still produce more Lannisters. So so could so could the uh, Cersei, I guess. Mm, they wouldn't be Lannisters. Tyrion already no, well, has just... Joffrey, right? Which is exactly which is how he power, right? It doesn't really need Cersei. No, isn't, but... isn't the problem well, except that's... for except for the name, he, like, I think he's a, he's such well, a prideful yeah, guy. Would... Like his kids are are ruling the kingdom, but as Baratheons, I don't think he likes that. No, but but then again, uh, he doesn't really count Tyrion as his son, his real son. Uh, he would never let Tyrion uh, control Castle Rock. I mean, he said that. I know it's weird, right? So that's not. But weird. at the end of the last book, he's like, "Why? Why are you doing this? Because you are my son." Yeah, but that's yeah. we we've been through that. We, yeah, we thought we a lot of us thought there was uh, manipulation. Like, yeah, you're the son that I need right now. Kind kind of boosting his ego so he can go down and kick some ass. I think it would be more of the case of like. He wouldn't want people to know that you could you could kidnap a Lannister. You can put a Lannister in that position. So it'd be more of just kind of you know saving face, like oh how dare you? It wouldn't yeah. be because oh my gosh my kids. No, it would be like yeah. how do, dare do you, you think, do that? Do you think he's just content to let uh, Kevin and and his kids kind of take over the Lannister name eventually? Ooh. Well, wow, yeah, I think actually yes. I think personally, I think because I think he respects uh, Kevin more than anyone else in the family, mm -hmm. uh, and I think as we seen saw in the last book that Kevin is almost as tough on on people as as Tywin was. Uh, so I think definitely that that could have actually have happened. That if nobody was left, then he would be okay with uh, Kevin's kid being the heir. So yeah. Rock. 
If Lancel didn't uh, become a shit. Yeah. Wait till uh, Tyrek comes back. Oh, yeah, that's right. And sits the throne. Um, yep. Okay, anything more on Cat One? Nope. New? We get the backstory on Harren Hall. Is that the first time we've heard it in this chapter? I think so. Maybe not. I think we we get it at like one of the flashbacks to the attorney at Harren Hall, right? I might be wrong. And I think it's just a castle then. Like, they don't describe the process of how um, Harren the Black brokered the Riverlands and they all starved and died and all the horrible stuff. It was just like a castle where the tourney happened. Maybe a big castle. Yeah, I can't remember either. Hmm. Anyways, either way. So, if no one's got anything else on Cat 1, then we move forward to Aria 3, um, which basically we just skip over a Tyrian chapter. And the chapter happens on 21st Feb, so basically it's just a few days later. And we are going to have Jackie, aka Joie Olivier, uh, recap that. So, But before we get into that, um, you've not been on the linear reread before, right? So I'm nope. not doing questions, you're already done. Excellent. Um, so how did you get into the books? How did you find Vassals of Kingsgrave? Have you done a reread before? Who's your favourite chapter? Sorry, character, all sorts of questions. Um, yeah, how do you get into the books and stuff? Yes. Um, I got into the books, actually, my friend was watching season two of Game of Thrones, and it was like the third episode or something, and I was like, well, I have the first book, should I, should I watch this? And she was like, yeah, 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 it, it won't be a big deal, just watch with us. And so I got spoiled for like, the end of the first book, and like, Khal Drogo being dead, and like, the dragons having hatched, and stuff like that. Um, but I did read all the books, and this is my first reread. Wow. Cool. And how did you come across um, either Podcast Device and Fire or Vassals of Kingsgrave? I came across Vassals of Kingsgrave from YouTube, like most new people. So, which was your first? Um, please, I don't think it was, it. please don't say Patrick was on it. <laughs> <laughs> please I'm do. not sure. Um, I can't remember. It was the Elaine chapter, I think. Oh, okay. Ooh, so ooh, one of spicy the spicy Sansa. So yeah. one of the feast dance reread, or one of the show, the Game of Thrones. No, it was um the. No, it was a spoiler chapter. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, oh yeah. Ooh, yeah, spicy. Okay. No Patrick, I think. No Patrick. No, uh, <laughs> sadly, no. What but is was, the deal was that with wasn't the, the, the Patrick the question? Was, it's just it's just so important to me. It's just basically uh, when Casey, aka Blue the Red Queen, I think, was on the forum f on the podcast for the first time. She was describing the episode she'd had that got her into the OK, and Patrick was just like, "Well, I thought it was quite funny." It was like, "Was I on it? Is that why you liked it? Is that what you?" So, <laughs> never mind. It's, it's okay if you if you did. You don't have to uh, like keep it to yourself. <laughs> you need to tell me. <laughs> No, I don't think Patrick needs his ego inflating more than more than it already is. Um, okay, cool. And then <laughs> I guess the next question is, um, how, what's your favorite character or scene or anything? Um, right now, my favorite character is Sansa, who I used to like really yes. hate. <laughs> like the first time I read the books, I was like, oh my god, this is like the most annoying character. She's just always whining and like she doesn't do anything. And then. Um, my opinion got drastically changed. So oh, so happy. Between me, you and Nadia, this is like the Sansa trifecta yes. of awesomeness. Love it. So um, let's get into Arya 3. Over to you. All right. Um, Arya and company continue on their way up to the wall, struggling with the bad roads. Arya is extremely paranoid after the encounter with the gold cloaks and sleeps clutching needle every night. The boys theorize as to why the queen wants Gendry, and Gendry insists that he never did anything to no queen. Yorin declares that they are not far from the god's eye, and that they will head west across to oh, west to cross the trident, as the king's road won't be safe for them. All the food from King's Landing has run out, and they are forced to poach and live off the land. Arya catches a rabbit, and Rorge calls her lumpy face, lumpy head rabbit killer. As they get further north, more and more guards and sentries are posted along the road to guard the crops and lands, and Yorin curses them. Let's see how well he likes it up there when the others come to take him. He'll scream for the watch, then he will. They come across a bur burnt village um, with carcasses of burnt animals and people that have been impaled on stakes. They find a woman with one arm, a bloody stump, and a baby girl. Hot Pie confesses, I never truly kicked no boy to death, Ari. I just sold my mommy's pies is all. The 
the woman's pleas and the baby's crying really disturb Arya, and she rides as far as she can from them in order not to hear them. That night, the woman dies, and Arya drinks too much water because there's almost nothing to eat. She sneaks off from the camp to pee and sees a whole pack of wolves. One of them comes out from the shadows, looks at her, and then they all leave. The encounter scares her, and she feels like a little girl and wishes she was home. As she tries to fall back asleep, she hears the howling of wolves and maybe the faint sound of screams. Yeah. <laughs> Great summary. Thank Good you job. very much. That's Good job. Very, con- very concise, precise, uh, and short. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was like, is it too long? Like, I-, I feel like not that much happens in this chapter that's, like, really significant. So I was like, hmm. No, it's perfect. It's more of a tone chapter. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, yeah. something I notice is the anxiety that Arya has when she's like, holy shit, this convoy is going so slowly. And she's always looking back, like, oh, when are they going to be coming up after me? And, yeah, just the fear because there's something wrong in the Riverlands, essentially. Yeah, and yeah at, especially at one point... with the Burnt Village. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, no, at one point, uh, the scouts say, like, there's armored men that are injured or something, and so they go, like, way out of their way to, like, just avoid them, because they're like, oh, well, they'll take our horses because we can't defend it, you know. So there is, like, anxiety. And then um, one other really sweet spot was uh, when the old woman with one arm and a stump gets uh, buried under the willow. The wind m- makes it sound like she's saying, still saying please. Mm. A little bit of the feels. Yeah. How about the wolves? Do you think it's like because because Martin George Martin he keeps on teasing us with that, with stuff like that? You mean we all kind of thought at some point that that Arya would get back with the with the Nymeria and they would kick ass around Westeros, right? So do you think that uh, this is sort of like an allusion to that, or is it just George uh, missing was? I'm not sure if it is. I think when I read it the first time, if I can think back to the mists of time in the last millennium, I, I did think that, you know, I was really hoping for Nymeria to be reunited with Arya because I was still in that sort of like non utterly jaded burned mode that George has now put me in. <laughs> but, I think, <laughs> but I think now on the reread, I never even thought of that. But yeah, you're right. At the time, I, I, it really did feel like he was living these little tantalizing clues of hope that maybe there was going to be a reunion. But at the same time, like reading it now, which is kind of what Michael is saying, you just feel, God, it's actually the messaging is really negative. It's taking so long. It's kind of like, you know, the build up to a horror chapter, which with Aria 4, we know is going to happen because it's, you know, nature's in uproar. It's taking too long. Hope is slipping away. They're starving. It's, yeah, it's all building up. It's a great, it's, I think it'd be quite interesting to read the build up to Yorin and sort of put it against the build up to some of the other kind of disaster chapters he has, like the Red Wedding, because I think he always does put these one or two chapters before that kind of ease you into that feeling of doom and terror. Such good writing. Yeah, he had had to do that. I mean, uh, that's why, that's why we we swallow those horses when we when uh, when they come. I mean, I think that the that George needs to do these things for us to accept uh, the horrors he's gonna bring upon us. Uh, it's oh, I agree. Uh, no, that makes that makes sense. I think the uh, the time when Eddard is in the Black Souls is like an early example of that. Maybe yeah, yeah. He, he, but the, in that specific situation, is a little less like that than the others because. He kind of doesn't take your hope away slowly in that situation. He actually gives you hope while he's in the black cells about actually not being able to get out of this. Uh, I feel like that was the entire uh, Dance with Dragons book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, John's not going to get murdered. Definitely not. Whoops. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Because I thought it was just hard. Yeah, he, he did not tackle that situation very well. Yeah. I feel like it's really. Gr- I think I don't know. We're way. It's like way ahead of now, but I. I think yeah. it's like it's such a slow grind there. Like it. Like I feel like it rereading the John chapters and dance. It's like yeah, he's so doomed. Yeah. <laughs> Can I go back to the wolves a little bit? Yeah. Um, sure. When I read this chapter, I kind of was just like, what was even the point of having the wolves? Like I don't like. Are they supposed to be part of Nymeria's pack? Like is she supposed to be like? connected psychically to all the wolves in her pack and like no it's Arya because like I that seems like a bit of a stretch to me or does she just come upon some random wolves you know like it just seems very like not really related to anything else right so in hindsight it it is more like uh I think 
the spiritual connection, like you were saying, like she, you know, she sees when she's over in Bravo, she sees like through Nymeria's eyes and stuff like that. And later on, I think even in um, A Storm of Swords. But I feel like this really didn't have a point. <laughs> I, like, I agree with you. It's like, w- what was the purpose of this? Like, I don't know if it was just to show that, like, the Riverlands were, like, so fucked that, like, actually living prey, the wolves were like, well, there's a bunch of dead bodies over here that we could go snack on. Like, we don't need to deal with you. Why wouldn't you much rather eat, like, slay and eat live flesh than dead? I mean... Aren't animals conditioned, unless they're sort of animals of prey, like sort of um, albatrosses, whatever. Aren't, aren't they conditioned, or sorry, vultures, aren't they conditioned to want to hunt and kill fresh meat? Because that's better for them, less corrupted flesh. Maybe. Crackpot theory, though. Maybe uh, they can sense that Arya is a, a, a skin changer, a warg, and uh, that's kind mm. of what makes her di- different. That's not that Well, that's why I say, like, in... Well, that's why I say in hindsight, like, that makes sense. But, like, if you're just reading this right now, it'd be like, uh, what was the point of that scene? Yeah, maybe. Like, it, well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, like, to me, just the to tease was, the readers. Yeah, it's it's, Nymer, it's Nymeria and atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you, you're, he's trying, definitely trying to uh, get us, uh, get our hopes up for uh, a Nymeria Aria uh, reunion. I think as a, and that's essentially what most people maybe uh, focus on when they read it the first time. It's like, oh my god, wolves, they 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 kind of bow down, so they must have a connection to Nymeria, right? <laughs> I mean, ne- oh, never mind oh the god. wolves. At this point of reading the book, at least the first time, at this point, yeah. I was completely convinced that Arya was going to make it back to Winterfell, or was going to make it back to her family. Like, she was really? with the Night's Watch. The Night's Watch were good people. She'd been saved from running around starving in King's Landing. She was on her way back. Yes, it might be slow, but it was going to be okay. It's Arya 4 that crapped all over that hope for me. So, really? Yeah. I kind of I, I kinda, kinda yeah. really uh, realized that the things were not really that going that well with Arya when, when I saw that there were so many Arya chapters. I mean, <laughs> what, how, how much... Uh, how many chapters do you need to tell the, the, the readers that things are going well and, and Arya's... You uh, can't read into she's that. She, she's you can't okay. read into that. She, you might still Lots see the politics in Winterfell. Shenanigans. Yeah, and also you might still want to see the action in Winterfell from her point of view because she's our funny little scamp heroine that everyone loves, right? Yeah. <laughs> she's getting a little dark, but yeah, I think at this point everyone's like, Team Arya. Yeah, I think that, that's Arya. the problem. That's the problem. Like coming back to this text now that we know what we know, and after however many rereads we've all done, it's hard to kind of remember that innocence and joyful journeying that we did the first time. But I, I think at this point, I was still pretty optimistic. Number one, that the series would end within like five books that would be published by now, and <laughs> <laughs> and the Starks would oh. somehow be sitting atop the throne. So yeah, what did I know? But um, uh, Claire, do you have anything on this chapter? Uh, no, I was just hopeful. I just, I, th- I guess like everybody else, I just thought, oh yeah, Maria. And yeah, like even though I had already kind of seen everything in the show, when I still read this, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, hope. But yeah. So when you, because you watched the show first, so when you were reading this and you knew what was going to happen to Yorin, it's kind of, yeah. inter- it's interesting to me that the, the, the writing is still powerful enough that you can still respond to that hope, even though you know what's coming yeah I did I definitely when I read it I was just kind of like oh my gosh like I just really even though I knew what happened what was going to happen I was still just kind of like oh my gosh like I really wish you made it home like oh Aria yeah yeah and I think the show was doing a kind of shitty job with Yorin until like he had this one like scene with Arya mm-hmm. talking about like I don't know someone killed his brother so he killed the guy and that's why he got sent to the wall or something but it, like really like cemented like that relationship and like made you more like sympathetic to the character and I think that's why when he you see him get killed you're like oh shit yeah whereas in the yeah, book yeah. it's like where in the book it's the relationship is you know well developed and you the character is like fleshed out obviously. Yeah, you have more time to do that. But uh, I think the thing that at least did it for me in the show was when he was part of that uh, that chanting that she started. He was kind of the one who edged her on to do that. Uh, in oh, the right. Show. Yeah, yeah. Saying that the was, names of the people. Yeah, exactly. That, that, was, that, was, that was kind of the moment where, where I thought that he became more compelling as a character because he gave that to her. So, yeah, I think you're right that... Uh, 
because of the books gives gives us much more time to relate to Yorin, and he does actively do more for Arya in the books than he does in the show. Uh, he, he becomes much more of a fleshed out character, right? Yeah, he kind of he totally embodies that um, thing in Tolkien, the like some like foul things that appear foul can be fair and vice versa. Mm. Oh, I like think he's... I think we have a lurker. Okay, so this chapter has been uh, ranked on the Tower of Hand as forty out of seventy uh, chapters, like right almost in the middle. Uh, do you think this is like is it fair to put this in the middle, or is it maybe just like a symptom of it being like a a, a a, char- a chapter that's leading up to some big event and therefore not has so much on it in itself. I think it's a little bit factual. I was talking about this with Matt earlier because we were talking about how awesome RF4 was and, you know, if you were to rate your favourite chapters, this would have to be, like, one of them. But isn't it just a bit weird to kind of rank the chapters because so much of their power comes in what they're leading up to or from, in a way? Right, yeah, there's not, really like, point. standalones. Like, there's standalone lines, like... You know, the night was awoken with or filled with like the sounds of dragons, and it's, it's like, oh yes, like that's that's the one. Um, but you know, there's like there's very few that just don't have that build up. Like you know, the red wedding chapter is obviously very powerful, but you get those like two chapters beforehand of Arya almost getting there and Cat getting there beforehand, and it's and then just makes it so much more powerful. Exactly, the red wedding is a great chapter on its own, but it's made better by the build up. So these chapters are great servants. Even, even in this chapter, the, the, the last line is amazing. It says, um, I don't remember it, but something about the screams. Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, it could, it could have been the wind or, yeah. It could have been the cries of men. Yeah. Or like uh, on Monday's podcast, I had a brand chapter and it, the last line was like, the wide world was calling and he knew he had to answer it or die. It's like, oh, that's a fucking great line. Funny how it's a bit grim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. When you remember that Bran is how old at this point? Like seven or some shit? Yeah, I think eight or nine, but uh, yeah, about there. At the age of eight or nine, all I cared about was basically oh, lemon nine. sherbet sweets. I think. I she... mean, remember, that's midlife crisis for them. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's, a, he's almost a man grown. <laughs> but isn't, isn't Arya only like a year older than Bran? So if she was oh, like yeah. eight, or nine, eight, eight, eight or nine on, when they were on Winterfell, wouldn't she be like ten, nine or ten now and then Bran be eight or nine? Yep, it's still little. I think Bran's nine and she's ten because I've. I think. Well, wait. She, we're doing she, a linear reread. We have a whole spreadsheet. We can look this shit up. Oh my! How much time has passed, B. Oh, <laughs> oh, Was George gosh. Takai just on for a second? <laughs> I can do. I can do a better George Takai. Takai, if you want. Uh, Go on then. I want to hear oh the Danish. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds like a really dirty oh old man. <laughs> Oh my! Yeah, I know. Uh, Jesus. We now have our bumper. Excellent. Um, anything else in this chapter? Okay. Um, d- just one thing. Like, okay, we see the like tide of humanity coming down the road, and then it kind of comes to a trickle. But then there's still like guards posted by like orchards and cornfields and stuff like that. But there's like two guards with like hatchets and like a dude sitting in the tree with a bow. Like, do the do they not know about like the actual fighting that's occurring or just want to protect their lands from like the travelers heading south? Because, you know, two guys it isn't going to stop like the Lannisters or the North. Yeah, it might just yeah, be a local. Yeah, I think local. it's just they poor just people know. coming along yeah, the road. Yeah, they're peasants. They're dirty peasants. I mean, Beyond. like, the people, they're farmers. And they, so they, <laughs> didn't, they don't, probably don't know the magnitude of like the reaving parties that are coming to fuck their crops up. <laughs> they're, they're not in on the uh, intel meetings. They don't have, like, a raven tower or anything. I mean, that's the basic <laughs> message of this chapter, isn't it? That the poor, you know, it opens up with people being strung up on the side of the road dying and animals just slaughtered. And that's the basic message of this chapter, you know. Ordinary people get screwed over and by war. So no matter how much of an idiot Rob was, Robert was, at least he brought stability to the realm until he didn't. Oh, Nadia dropping the knowledge. Fucking boars. Bran is eight and a half at this point. Thank you, Nadia. By the way, Nadia, so, did we ever get a response from the Redditor when you asked about the whole In at the Crossroads thing? Uh, no, we did not. Boo. He can't handle the uh, truth. Pooey. Was that the... What was that? Oh, the, yeah, okay. So that that and... We also had a question about the Danny chapter that takes, right, like over the Red Waste that's like for months and months, but we didn't know where to put it in the reread. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, we we're going to put it in later on because of the uh yeah, because it takes it spans like several months and I think. Yeah, no. I mean that I can kind of figure out, but I think the the logistical stuff about where specific battles happen and that's kind yeah, of more yeah. serious. That's that's more than just a sort of how do you split up the text question. Um okay, so on to Tyrion 2. So Tyrion 2. Woohoo! Tyrion rocks. Yeah, we love Tyrion. All right. Hey Amber. Okay. Hi Amber. What the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah. I was fucking invited. I was invited here, and that's all I could think not, to not do. Not by me. Not by me, Amber. <laughs> yeah, but by me, and I am the boss lady. So. Uh, hey, Amber. Boss lady. Hello, everyone. Where's hey, Jackie? Amber. Hello. Where's Jackie? Hi. They're the same voice. They're calling do from it the again. same place. Anyone? <laughs> do it again. What? Sound like Amber? Do I sound like that? Jackie, do you not think you sound... Jackie, do you not think... Like, to me, as a British person, like, I think you both sound very similar. It's quite spooky. Nah. Well, as long as yeah, the voice is a little deeper, more like than wait, White wait, Raven. Wait, Who's Dog, talking right now? Doesn't stand. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. My it's friend. White Raven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gotta go. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have lots Bye, of fun. Amber. Bye, Amber. Bye. Bye, Amber. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so after uh, a little non-linear skip to Amber, we go back a chapter from Aria 3 to Tyrion 2. So we're now three days later, it's February 24th, and it's over to Nadia. Okay, so Tyrion 2. Uh, Tyrion hosts Janna Slint at dinner with um, some great food and fine wine. He does his best to get Slint drunk, which isn't really that difficult. Uh, they discuss who will replace Slint as Lord Commander, of the City Watch, now that Slint is Lord of Harrenhal. Slint has suggested Alardim, his right-hand man. Tyrion wants Jocelyn by water, but Slint tells him by water is too honourable. But Alardim is loyal and will follow orders, and not question them. Tyrion asks about some trouble Deem had at a brothel, and Slint tells him Dean was only doing his duty when he killed Robert's bastard daughter and a mother, but does not tell Tyrion who had ordered it. Tyrion also questions him about Eddard Stark's execution and why Slint had let the execution go forward when Lord Stark had been meant to take the black. When Slint loses his patience, Tyrion quickly informs him he will be sent to the wall and his eldest son will take his place as lord, though he will not get Harrenhal. Slint declares he will go to the king or Littlefinger or the queen and walks away. But Tyrion already has Sir Jocelyn Bywater, the new commander of the City Watch, waiting to take Slint into custody. Tyrion tells Sir Jocelyn that uh, six other men are to accompany Slint to the wall, but um, that Aradim should be thrown overboard on the way. After they're gone, Varys comes to visit. Tyrion tells Varys he knows Cersei sent the gold cloaks to kill Robert's little daughter, but Varys already, already knows. Tyrion is furious because he can't touch Cersei yet. Instead, he must make do with punishing Slint and Dean. They also discuss how Ned Stark's death seemed to be Joffrey's idea. Baris is glad that now Tyrion has the city watch on his side, he can prevent the king from committing any further follies. They revisit Varys' riddle, but Tyrion still is not sure where true power resides. And Varys tells him, power resides where men believe it resides, no more and no less. Varys then, bring, then brings out a list of people committing treason. The first is the captain of a galley who plans to offer his sword and ship to Stannis. Tyrion puts him down for a dose of Joffrey's justice. Also, the Red Wine twins have managed to bribe a guard to let them leave the city, and Tyrion sends him off back into the wall too. Uh, a jest Sir ba Bail and Swan made is also on the list, but Tyrion decides to, to let that go. After Varys leaves, um, Bronn tells Tyrion he has recruited three more men, which I assume are the Kettle Blacks. Uh, Tyrion asks him whether he would kill a babe still at a mother's breast if ordered. Bronn says he would only ask how much he'd be paid for it. So we knew Bran was, uh, Bron was uh, kind of like a scoundrel, but did anyone else, like, you know, estimation of him go way down when he's like, yeah, how much? Hell yes. I mean, we yep. knew he was yeah. a scoundrel and a mercenary, but I really, like, he really has no lower limit, right? So right. this is beyond what we've seen him do before now. So yeah, it did. Yeah, and it kind of kind of abode the the situation that is is, is George is kind of putting underlining the uh, cell sort of uh, part of Bron uh, to the readers as well. He's trying to make sure that that people when Bron essentially is gonna 
not so much uh, stab Tyrion in the bra- back, but more like abandon Tyrion. Feel you keep on feeling it's that natural. Well, he's telling us about oh that they're doing this stuff together, and and Bronn knows all those secrets, and he's he's cool with all that and stuff like that. Uh, he kind of also wants to remind us that this is only fleeting still what, because Tyrion has the money and the power. That's what he's trying to like anchor us in our in our uh, hope that there might be a bromance brewing there, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bronn's not a lovable rogue. No, I mean, not Tyrion so much. Yeah. Sort of fantasy that like secretly Bronn is his friend and he'll always stick with him through thick and thin. Um, but yeah, as we find out, that's not the case, which is really that- sad because. I, th- I think Tyrion's, Tyrion's fantasy is is show Bronn, right? Tyrion's fantasy is is the buddy relationship right. they have on the show. Yeah, oh. um, the show I mean, is but, like uh, Tyrion's fanfic. But but now I'm <laughs> like I'm thinking about it. Like, how does our estimation of Tyrion not change? Because he just ordered what two or three people's m- murders, like in the same chapter. Those are adults, and they're traitors. They're traitorous scum. Yeah, but those are actual murders. That, you know, he poses Bronn a hypothetical. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, there's the, always the the thing with the uh, the protagonist of this, the 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 point of view character is always kind of excused from from doing heinous stuff that is not so bad. So it might just be that. I mean, a lot of people, including myself, kind of get gave Tyrion a pass on a lot of the the heinous stuff he did through the books. Especially, it's just mainly just when like later books when he. It uh, goes all drunken Tyrion and and self pity Tyrion that you kind of get open your eyes for what kind of nasty stuff that Tyrion's capable to do. I think that's a great right? yeah. it's a great point, and but it's, it's point... something I've always had about people's attitudes towards Arya and Tyrion. That by the end of where we get to, they they're really quite questionable in their moral content, and I just think because we've loved them early, we give them way too much of a free pass. As opposed to Sansa, so you know. But anyway, I'm yeah. I'm boring on that topic. Well, also, think... you go first, Adam. I was bored. <laughs> so this is just going to be like kind of rehashing something from the last podcast that hasn't come out yet. But um, basically, I think that like the the deal with Arya and it applies a bit to Tyrion is that they are both kind of victims in a way. They have horrible things happen to them all the time. Sansa and like human na- hum- Well, no, no, but see, I'm getting there. And human nature is that when we see someone victimized, we like to say like, oh, well, someone, you know, was going down a dark alley and they got mugged. Well, I wouldn't be going down that dark alley. It's their own fault, right? Because we want to feel powerful. We want to feel like it won't happen to us. And with Sansa, she does nothing, right? And she just, and we're like, well, I would never do that. I would stand up for myself, et cetera, et cetera. You see Arya, you see Tyrion, they're trying to kind of take it back. They're trying to go after people and not be victims. So I think we identify with that more than we should. Bouncing off of that Good too. Um, there's also the issue of like talking again about Tyrion and how like and are is like how people say certain things, but then when they're actually put under pressure, they don't do the right thing or the good thing. With Tyrion, when uh, Jan Oslin is talking about um, the Rob Robert's um, bastard that gets murdered, the baby and the mom. Um, Jano says, a good commander knows his men, Tyrion. Some are good for one job, some for another. Doing for a babe and her, her still in the tit, it takes a certain sort. Not every man do it, even if it was only some whore in her whelp. And Tyrion thinks, I suppose that, or he says, I suppose that's so, said Tyrion, hearing only some whore and thinking of Shay and Taisha long ago and all the woman, other women who had taken his coin and his seat over the years. And then you have that, and then you juxtapose it with Tyrion and dance with, like, how rapey he gets and, like, how horrible he is to, like, and what he does to Shay. And, like, it's like, yeah, he has these, like, views, but then when he actually, like, when you put any sort of pressure on him, he just does horrible shit. <laughs> He's a great example about how we can all have these highfalutin ideals, right? But when faced with real tough decisions, what happens? Yeah. And to that extent, he's yeah. not that different from Tywin as far as he's a real, he, you know, real politic. It's pragmatic. He wants to keep the family in power and, and make them win in King's Landing as much as anyone else at this point, I think. Yeah. Right. And there's got to be a fine line between like charity and discipline to like maintain that power. So they're willing to do you know, willing to protect a brothel, but then throw another dude overboard. Yeah, but the person he's having thrown overboard just killed a baby, so... Yeah, I mean, I guess. At this point, he hasn't really ordered anyone's death who, you know, who we should really be mourning. No, it's very soon that they, uh, the singer gets, 
Killed that's right. fucking gross, man, because oh a, a whole bunch of people in Flea Bottom like just ate a person. They didn't even know about it. Well, they could have used the meat. They were pretty hungry. Yeah. Oh. But still. Michael. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a George thing to do and say. Yeah, but that that's in a future chapter. We're not supposed to discuss that until before it comes, right? Whatever, I brought up dance like four times already. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, don't, I don't think there's a strict prohibition on it at all. Okay. But, yeah. That's good. Uh, but that said, anything else on this chapter? Uh, Jackie, yeah. anything? Um, Ooh. no, not really. I just realized um, how many people I'd forgotten about. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do. I had to go look up. Uh, yeah, I had to go look up. Uh, was it Hober Redwine or the Redwine Twins or something? I was like, yeah. who is that? <laughs> horror and slobber. Yeah, Hober. Yeah, and Hober and slobber. Then their names yeah. are Horror yeah. and Hober or something. That's the sort of stuff I do. Um, yeah, it's like when you talk to a show watcher, you have to remind them that you've forgotten more characters than they've seen on the screen. Ooh, I love that elitism. <laughs> uh, can we talk about the opening sentence of this chapter, Amanda? You love it, right? I mean, I, don't, I think it's gross, but I think it's, I don't know, it's very visceral. I'll read it out loud just for the benefit of the listeners. Jano Slint was a butcher's son and he laughed like a man chopping meat. I think it's both kind of... Of cra- I think it's kind of crappy writing, but I also think it's kind of funny too. So it's just like, I don't know how I am divided on it. <laughs> well, see, this is my point about this, that this chapter is not written by, from the point of view of George making a point. It's written from the point of view of Tyrion. So <laughs> it implies that Tyrion is making a judgment about Jano Slint as a butcher's boy that he thinks of him, therefore, in these gross terms. And, you know, because Nadia and I did these kind of War of the Roses um or, you know, like the British history equivalent to Song of Ice and Fire podcast. And it just really reminded me of how the aristocrats of the Tudor era would really um, kind of snigger at people like Thomas Cromwell and um, Cardinal Wolsey as just being these kind of, you know, lower class butcher's boys who had aspired to great power. But no matter how many lordships they got and how many castles they got would never truly be aristos. And I kind of felt that George was maybe making an analogy because the butcher's boy, I mean, that is the way Woolsey is always kind of described disparagingly and with actually that kind of um, language. And maybe he's making a point like what Adam was saying that, you know, in retrospect, Tyrion does have judgments that aren't as even handed and as fair as we would like to think. Like he's clearly an Aristo judging this jumped up little, you know, working class man. But that's oh, my interpretation. I don't know. I mean, feel free to disagree. But wouldn't wouldn't Wosley be more like uh, the High Sparrow, like in a institution that is pa- uh, like powerful, but he himself like came from nothing? We don't like, know Cromwell. that High Sparrow came from nothing, do we? Yeah, but well, I, he, I mean, he pretends, or he, uh, I, I don't know if he pretends or not, but like he wants to be the most humble person you know if that makes any sense <laughs> but you know at this um, point went... Janice Slint is sitting in front of Tyrion as the guy who's owning Harrenhal right so he has gone from being a butcher's boy to someone who holds a great castle in the land and which would be more Thomas Cromwell right yeah but both of them both of them were butcher's boys who were then criticized for aspiring to high office who, I mean it's very analogous and that's why Thomas Cromwell was very per Hilary Mantel was very loyal to um, Wolsey because he related to him. So I think it's, I, I don't know, I just feel that the first time I, or the first few times I read it, I thought, this is really cool, you know, George is making this really astute, it's just wonderful writing. But on this reread, I was like, but this is Tyrion thinking this. And Tyrion, who's the guy who we always think goes for the underdog, doesn't judge people by their physical appearance because he knows that he's judged for being a dwarf, um, is fair to women, is, you know, generally like a nice guy to Sansa, you know, he's the good guy, but even he's indulging in this. And it just made me respect him a little bit less. So, yeah, maybe. yeah, but then you gotta remember that Jano Slint is a shit. Yeah, but yeah, no. but he, the fact that he's a shit does not derive from the fact that his father was working class. No, but it, no, no, but it might make Tyrion already he, uh, dislike him so much that he grabs at any possibility to hate more on him. Yeah, you, which is you know prejudice. What I feel? Which is just prejudice. It's, yeah, no, I think yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's hate fuel prejudice, which is kind of like uh, you, you. Is there any other this, kind? <laughs> I think it's just one of those institutionalized things, like regardless of the way that he's been treated, it's still just one of those things of like, I'm still, I'm still a no, I'm still noble born. Like at least I have that and he doesn't. Exactly, Claire. I mean, I think for me, Tyrion, no matter how nice he is and empathetic at the end of the day, he's still a Lannister and a Lannister still 
values himself as a noble. Yeah. You know, there's also this uh, description of the wine um, is is common for George, and he goes over, like, the Dornish wines and the Arbor wines, and, like, Janusslin can't tell them apart, and I also think that's Tyrion's view, seeming like, ooh, look at this new money here, he can't even tell the wines apart. Yeah, I could just be giving him two buck chuck and what do you know? Exactly. (laughs) So Tyrion, Tyrion. Oh, Bina, I love love the fact that you know about two buck chuck. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm a woman of the people. (laughs) I too was a student once. Okay, so another thing, what what if it, do you think, I think the Tyrion, the way he, this this is another uh, example of of Tyrion paying his way to relationships and and the people in the the relationships, the people he pay for the relationships kind of tell him in, while he, they're they're in the relationship with him that, that they're gonna not like so much into it as he is. But he kind of wants it to be. He kind of yeah. There's something very yeah, messed up about Tyrion that he can only yeah, he, have these relationships that are sort of commercially brokered in a way, and probably doesn't yeah, even fact, realize he's doing it. He, I'm sure he doesn't realize that he's doing it. He he always pays for his things because he thinks that he's. He might not think that he's worth like a a regular having a regular friend or something like that. I mean, the only person that he thinks that actually he knows that loves him and respects him is his brother. Uh, but he's never really talked about anyone else in his family or anywhere else that hasn't been paid to like him, essentially. Yeah, other than Jerry and Lannister, I think, who's such a minor character. Oh, yeah. And then he w- goes away, right? <laughs> yeah, to find Bright Rar. Yeah. So, yeah, you, I mean, I think that's it's quite uh, descript- descriptive that they he, Martin is talking about how Tyrion again is is trying to find common ground with the with one of his uh, servants. I mean, uh, Bronn is sort of like a servant right now, and so is Shay, just for different yeah. purposes. And and then trying to become friends with them when when George and then George also makes it very clear that they're not in it for the friendship or the the companionship. They're in it for the money. Matt, did you have something to say? No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Um, anything else on this chapter from anyone else? No. Um, I guess guess we should clarify with the benefit of hindsight. When Varys talks about saving another bastard, it's Gendry, right? I'm not. Gonna, yeah. 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 Cool. Mm. More comet stuff. People going over to Stannis. Sure. People, you know, preachers starting to proselytize in King's Landing. Um, I I always thought that you know Stannis was sort of fighting a lost cause because, um, his he didn't seem to have that many people around him. Like he, he had very few bannermen and then um, the, all of the boats that they had sort of captured were trying to get away. But you hear about this captain who's in King's Landing who's, who wants to swear his sword to Stannis. That was just surprising. Mm. Also, um, this chapter is like one of those George, like, I think someone just mentioned it, but like really food heavy, descriptive, like, you know, they're tasting different cheeses, you know, the Dornish and uh, different wines and stuff like that. It's not not the chaps to read when you're on a diet. (laughs) Right, right, because I want to eat all those things. And I also meant like there's a food shortage reference. I think Tyrion says, yeah, enjoy this wine while it lasts because High Gardens just closed off the Rose Road. Um, and I think every time you're in a Clash of Kings, you're in King's Landing, there'll always be a reference in the chapter that there's not a lot of food in King's Landing. Yeah, build up to the riots and stuff. But also, yeah, like, right. doing the linear reread in this order, like, coming on the back of the last chapter where, you know, Arya and Gennery are having to basically catch and, like, oh, would you like half, like, half of a rabbit's leg to share? We're so starving. And the, the, the riverlands are so, not riverlands, but the country's so ravaged. And then Tyrion, like, gorging on good wine and mocking this kid for not knowing, you know, good wine from bad and all this variety of cheese. It's just mm. even more disgusting, by contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Side note, do you think that the King's Landing is like a like a artificially grown city? I mean, you know, some cities, they, they grow naturally and, and the food around them can support the city to a certain extent. But it seems to me like King's Landing wouldn't be able, or the surrounding lands wouldn't would be able to uh, uh, like support King's Landing at all. Well, it sounds it it sounds like Stokeworth and you know the area like uh, what's it, the Kingswood is like pretty 
fertile, but obviously it can't support the entire city, and it's mostly on imports, which you know I think most major cities are. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's been like three hundred years, and it's already grown to be a, a like the largest city in Westeros. So one would th- kind of think that it artificially grown grew grew to this size, uh, and not so much naturally as because of because of its uh, positioning on the river or something else. A lot of the other to- towns, usually in in real world history, have have opened up because it's a lot of small towns have grown into a larger town because of the uh, the the position of the flood, the yeah, the river, or whatever, uh, makes the food so bountiful that there can be so many cities and there are so many towns that would grow st- together to be form a bigger city, right? Right. So wouldn't that be like a city like Hong Kong or something where it's an actual just an island and Maybe. like dependent on all imports because obviously you can't I mean you could grow food on it but not enough to sustain the entire city, right? Yeah. It's like all major metropolises, isn't it? Like from time of memorial, you know. Yeah, very few... all they have to do is be on trading routes, uh at yeah, a port, exactly. Uh, it's it's yeah. like, you know, yeah, by definition, they support themselves through trade, almost. Yeah. So, on to Aria 4, which involves skipping forward four chapters, but just four days to the 28th of February, 299. And this is, oh my goodness, this is the chapter that's going to bring on all the feels. And I do not envy Matt having to summarise this chapter, so over to you, Matt. <sighs> okay, so they're still along the road, and they see a uh, dead and bloated soldier in the reeds, and Yorin says, go check him for weapons or coin, and they find a little purse, and they find a, a couple of coins and a locket of blonde hair, which is just fucking heartbreaking. Um, they continue on, um, and they find a, a village that hasn't been burnt, but no one's there, Um they say in the hold fast, uh, you know, um, Sir Emery and Lorch comes and and sets fire to the town, and then they they want to uh, they want to get into the hold fast, and Yorin puts up a fight and says, "No, we're the Night's Watch. We take no part. You, like all I have is young boys for the watch. Like, I'd, you know, like go elsewhere. Like, we're not going to fight you. We don't want to. Like, burn down the town. We don't give a shit." But uh, Emery Lorch says, well, you're, you guys are rebels, so we're coming in and killing you. So they start storming the walls, and Arya yells Winterfell, and Hot Pie yells Hot Pie, which is fucking awesome. Um, eventually they're overrun, and Yorin says, you know, get, uh, tells Arya to get everyone out, get whoever she can out uh, through the trapdoor, and he goes back to fight. So she gets... Uh, Gendry, um, Hop High, and Lamy, even though Lamy's been stabbed through the shin or thigh or something, um, and the crying girl. And they go into a barn that's completely engulfed in fire and go through the trap door. And <laughs> um, Jackin says, uh, Boy, is it, is it war? Is it red war? Like a man can fight, which I thought was hilarious. And then Later, he's like, boy, boy, let us out. Like, he just keeps on, he's very, like, um, he's very uh, civil. Meanwhile, like, Biter at Roars is like, get us the fuck out of here. Um, and so Arya f- finds an axe, go- goes back outside, gets an axe, gives it to uh, Rorge, and they break out and somehow become part of the Lannister party. I don't know how that happened, but that's later on. But, um, yeah, her, Gendry, Lamy... The crying girl and Hopeye all escaped through the underground tunnel. And a couple of times during this um, during this chapter, uh, Arya she bathes in the lake and she says it smells like you know water and mud and life. And she says the same thing when she hits like the mud in the tunnel. She's like, oh, it smells like you know mud and worms, but life. And I thought that was particularly uh, you know kind of moving um and then i think that's all i have everyone's basically butchered we find out in the next chapter you know who was butchered but uh even as they you know pled for mercy they still got butchered yeah but um, it's 80 pages when you read it the first time that you don't know what happened to your own um, right 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 it's not good. um 
So How? then my, my theory is that because this book came out in 1999 and I was actually dating a blonde lady at that time, that George wrote me in as a dead bloated corpse. <laughs> what? Because of the locket with blonde hair? Yep. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Can can someone explain to me how does um how does Yorin know that that basically you can go through a tunnel in a barn and it's going to lead to the lake? Like he, he searched it out. He, he found it. The lake? Uh, has he, he done it earlier? He, yeah, he found it earlier and went and saw that it led to the lake, and that's why they put a cart over the door so no one can come in that oh, way. Okay, okay, okay. So it's not just that he's MacGyver; he just knows shit. Okay. You all thought that Yorin yeah. was dead the first time you read this. I didn't think they would make it. But at the same time, I was like, you're in, like, through all these chapters, he really, like, banks a lot of, like, this is the Night's Watch, everyone knows what we do. Like, everyone knows, like, the proper etiquette to, like, you know, even in the uh, previous Aria chapter, he bitches about, like, having to pay for corn, and it's like, oh, we used to be feasted, like, up and down the Crimson's Road, or whatever. So, I don't know. I think he put yeah, too much I'd faith in that. Yeah, and... To see what Yorin's perspective of the previous war, uh, Robert's Rebellion, was like, because I think he says in this chapter that he's been doing this for thirty years, um, and obviously in yeah, he does. Robert's Rebellion, there was no traumatic event like this that made him think, "Hmm, next time there's a war, I'm just going to take a fucking boat to the wall." He's like, "No, no, no, the code, we can, the Night's Watch code will take us to the Riverlands. We won't get slaughtered." Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and he says, uh. Was it this chapter or the last Aria chapter where it's like, in all those 30 years, he's only lost like three guys. It's like one died from the flu, one died when a snake bit him while taking a shit, and then the other guy tried to attack him during the middle of the night and he killed him. It's a great chapter, though. It's also an another very unpleasant chapter to read uh, as you get to the end, and Arya has to run through the burning barn, and all the animals are screaming, and there's smoke everywhere, and then she has to run out again to get the axe, and yeah, I, I, I'm like clutching um, my bedpost as I'm reading this. <laughs> right, and, and she even, like, there's even that line, it's like, going back into the barn was the hardest thing she ever had to do. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> like, and things just, oh yeah, things just got really intense. It was, uh, there's great descriptive uh, words where she thinks they're fireflies, but then she realizes that they're like torches, and then like you know the village is going up in flames, and like how the how the soldiers' armors are reflecting those flames and everything. It, it was it's a great chapter. Silence. Any comments from anyone? Blood Raven. Or are we all just doing one minute silence for you're in? I just really feel for her, especially the last the last line in that chapter where she like just kisses the mud on the floor and like she just begins to cry and she doesn't even know who for she just cries and i think that's when i actually really really started to like aria because even though she was a bit extreme she like i think i always remember this moment as just her just being human and crying because she doesn't understand what's going on yeah so the line is aria held her breath and kissed the mud on the floor of the tunnel and cried for whom she could not say you know she you didn't like aria online. since the beginning no. Oh no, I did. I did. I've always liked Arya, but it's just I always just kind of thought, oh, okay, she's going to be like the kind of tough kid, and she kind of like she doesn't she she doesn't like anybody helping her and things like that. And I always thought she didn't get really attached to people, but just that when she cries, it just when I first read this, I I like I got a bit teary eyed because I was like, crap, like damn, Arya's crying. Yeah, interesting. It's it's wherever you stand on the character of Arya. This is a devastating chapter. She's seen her father die, and now this only other, you know, she was saved by this other guy who she knows is a good guy because her beloved step, um, half brother's gone to join his band, and she knows they're good, and maybe he'll get her home, and then it all falls to shit within a matter of, you know, a few months. It's horrible. It's just grim. Right. And like we were talking about before, like in the beginning of this chapter, there's like a certain like tranquility but uneasiness. Like everything's too quiet kind of feeling to this chapter and you know that that makes the ending of the chapter even more like profound i think i feel the like this is just of where the whole past um it seems so unnecessary something i noticed um like when Amberly lorch orders his men to go take this like a lot of them die like aria kills at least three dudes and i just was thinking yeah. <laughs> it did so, seem a little unnecessary yeah like, 
Like, a lot of your dudes are going to die taking this hold fast. You should know that. Like, storming any castle or whatever is costly, but he does it anyway. It's just, you're an idiot, Amory Lorch. I'm glad you get eaten by that bear. <laughs> yeah. I, I also think this chapter is a good demonstration of the fact that Arya has empathy. Because I feel like people like to say that Arya doesn't have empathy and that she's like a sociopath. And that I really just don't think that's true. I think she's just like yeah. very traumatized. Especially when um, there's this, like, it's like, this is one of those chapters where you just see her innocence getting squashed. Because she, 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 when um, Amory, Amory Lurch and everybody are approaching the Holdfast, she keeps on wanting to be like, look with their eye, look with your eyes. Can't you see? Like, she's so innocent that she doesn't think, she like can't recognize that. Amory Lorch has no empathy and does not care. He doesn't even. It doesn't even matter whether or not they are actually affiliated with Beric Dondarrion. He just likes to kill people. I completely agree. Right. And Arya has to have empathy at this point because otherwise, what happens to her as she becomes so um, guarded, hardened, jaded, hardened, jaded, whatever it is that she's going to become? But is the tragedy if she started off basically as a natural born psychopath who just had no empathy? It wouldn't be a sad tale. You know, she, at this point, she has to still have empathy, even for people yeah, like me who really question what she becomes without giving away stuff. Well, too I mean, well. she even uh, saves the crying girl, even though there's a line that so like she wouldn't even she wouldn't move even when she was slapped in the face, like, but she still saves her. Whereas I feel like you know, current Arya would be like, well, tough fucking luck. Yeah, I would have ditched her. I'd be like, fuck that, I'm getting out of here. I don't want no baby. <laughs> And I mean, yeah, even saving Lami. Lamy... Yeah, Lami, you also could have left him behind. He was obviously going to die from an infection. Right. Also, Aww. we got to remember that uh, Amory Lorch is a really good guy um, who killed Elia's daughter because uh, the daughter kicked him, so he had to stab her like a hundred times. He's he's far worse than the Hound, isn't he? I mean, he's he's almost like the Mountain. He's yeah, really, yeah, he's not a nasty piece of shit. You know. Yeah. So I think he uh, deserved everything that was coming to him later on. Agree. Mm. Yeah, what if I could give that bear no, a medal, I would. <laughs> but, okay, but okay, George always says there's some light in the dark, in the darkness. What's what? If just to theorize, what do you think that that uh, Amor Lorch's light side might be? Well, his house sigil is a manticore, which means he must hold lands, which means that. He's probably doing what he has to do to like maintain those lands, so the people on his lands, you know, can eat shit like that. So you think you that know, he's probably a fair and just protective ruler? I mean, we don't know. We know, like, you know, Bruce Bolton, you know, will rape a uh, Miller's wife, you know, just for getting married. Exactly. Like, not everyone has a light side. The mountain doesn't. Bruce Bolton doesn't. I mean, there's no like redeeming, you know, soft, fluffy side to the mountain. So. Well, the mountain has constant migraines, so it could be, you know, a psychological disorder. Oh, it's not blame. Just I'm just ones. saying that the light side doesn't exist, you know. Right. Okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering. I'm kind of. But God bless you, Patrick, for... for trying to find it. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. the effort. Um, well, we can close out unless anyone's got anything else on Aria for. Yeah, I think there's one last thing for me. Yep. I thought that um, it's it stood out to me that she she called out for Winterfell, uh, and that it later on makes uh, Gendry like she, he thinks there's something up, right? But uh, already to begin with, she must. I mean, I'm just assuming there's different accents and dialects from wherever you wherever you are from in 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 the uh, Westeros, right? Right. I either either she sounds like a, a northerner or or she sounds like a highborn girl, highborn person. Uh but, but what does hop high sound like when he yells out hop high? It's it's yeah, I don't know. An o overweight uh person from King's Landing. <laughs> yeah. He sounds adorable. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You wanna give him a hug. Yeah. So just like I'm not the if... only, I'm not the only one who knows what their battle cry would be, right? Like you've all thought, like what you would shout going into battle. No, okay. no. What's yours? I'd be like, I'm going for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Running the opposite direction. It's actually it's, this is totally a poll we should do on the podcast about some fire forums of best battle cries because you know it's got to be for Thalingus, right? Um, okay. Death and death and honor. 
Um, I have I have another thing. Um, was it this chapter where she's thinking about um, when they'll um, reach Harren Hall, Lady Went will um, yes. help them out? Yeah. And there's this passage oh. which could almost have been um, Sansa thinking it, and I'm I'm trying to find it. Because I yeah, asked yeah, it's, 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 it's like. It's like it would she be has knights and knights. Hall, it would be knights. Arya yeah. could reveal herself to Lady Vent and the knights would escort her home and keep her safe. That was what knights did. They kept you safe, especially women. That's so yeah, that, that's so sweet. That's very Sansa. Coming from Arya, it's so tragic. Knowing what, what's going to happen to her personality, really. Yeah, but you have to think about it. Like Essentially, Arya has been taught by the same person. Uh, val- like restores to values. She's been taught by Septim Dane, which is a devout person, and and would obviously tell her that knights are true and and the seven are the best, or maybe not so much the seven because she knows she's in the north, but uh, stuff like that, you know. Tell them, actually, tell them the good stuff. It's analogous to the whole Tyrion thing we were discussing, right? Like Tyrion can be as subversive as he wants, but ultimately he's a Lannister, so he has some of those prejudices. And it's the same with Arya. Arya can like think all the needlework and all the stuff Sansa likes is silly. At the end of the day, she's still a highborn lady who had that education and who's going to think certain things. You know, you can't totally escape your upbringing. Maybe not. Okay, so now on the IM chat for the benefit of the listeners, Nadia and I are debating whether for Frodo beats for their lingers. I just want to change. What their lingers is like. The best thing. Well, it's in the books, right? Because for Frodo is only in the movie. I know, but it's so so moving. It just makes so me cry. It doesn't cry. count at all. But it still counts. It makes me cry. But yeah, fourth day, I think this is fucking badass. Okay. <laughs> so I think that about closes up the discussion for today. I would like to thank everyone for joining. So that is Amanda, Nadia, Adam, Jackie, Claire, Matt. Michael and Sir Patrick at the very end, last but not least. Thank you. Not uh, very least. Not least. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say, if for those of you following along at home, there may or may not be a bit of a hiatus for this um, linear reread over Game of Thrones TV show. Just kind of depends how many um, TV show reviews that come out, because otherwise it gets a bit crowded putting out all the content. So we may be taking a 10-week recess, but if not, there might be one or two in the middle. But the next chapter will cover um, the events of the 3rd of March to the 17th of March, which is Sansa 2, Davos 1, yay! Tyrion 3, Arya 5, yeah. and Bran 2. So for all the Davos fans out there, you finally get your guy. So that's kind of it. Okay. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, have a lovely weekend.